Before and during World War II, Germany was developing revolutionary weapons that would become the most feared and also the most desired after the war. One of these was the Messerschmitt Mi-262 twin-engine jet fighter bomber. It had a tortured development and combat debut marred by political infighting and limited resources, and yet it still made its mark in aviation history, as did the men who flew it. Who created the Mi-262? What was its strengths and weaknesses? Why did the Luftwaffe pilots who flew it think of it? What did Allied airmen think about it when they encountered it? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. The Mi-262 was the creation of several hands. The airframe was designed by Professor Dr. Willy Messerschmitt, the famous designer who brought the BF-109 and 110, as well as other legendary aircraft to life. Chief engineer on the airframe was Dr. Rudolf Seitz, among others. The power plant designed was developed by Dr. Hans Joachim Papst von Ohain, who studied the jet engine design patented by Frank Whittle in Britain. But he saw a need for improvement, and he built his prototype engine in 1937. After a few design options and changes, and the smaller BMW-designed engines were in time replaced with the UMO 004 engines, more powerful and efficient. Politics and rivalries killed Whittle's opportunity to have the accolades of having the first jet to see combat. But the Mi-262 also had its own shortcomings. Politics also plagued the German jet, but not by parliamentary and military ignorance and prejudice. Germany suffered from an abundance of the necessary raw materials, in particular cobalt, chromium, aluminum, and manganese, which were in high demand. The first test flights occurred in April 1941 and continued into 1943, when General of the Fighters Adolf Galland flew the tail dragger version. He was extremely impressed and knew that it was a fighter that the Luftwaffe had to have. To his great dismay, Hitler wanted the jet to be built as his Blitz bomber, which delayed fighter production and hindered the fighter arm from receiving the weapon that could have probably given them air superiority against the massive Allied bomber formations. Hitler finally relented and allowed one fighter for every bomber delivered, and the Mi-262 went into operation in July 1944. Both the jet and bomber pilots began making their mark. The first fighter victory was over an RAF Mosquito on July 26, 1944 by a Lieutenant Schreiber of Eperbundungskommando, or EKDO, meaning Experimental Commando 262. Galland was still arguing for jet fighters as Hermann Goering was blaming the fighter pilots for not doing their job. Hitler then told Galland to form a unit, a fighter wing, to prove his theory, so he did. In late September 1944, Galland selected the best EKDO-262 pilots to form a specialized unit, and he chose the meteoric 23-year-old Major Walter Novotny. Novotny was a 255 victory ace, recently awarded the diamonds to his Knight's Cross, and an Austrian, and was one of Hitler's favorites. Later that month, he had the jets and the pilots. The unit was called Commando Novotny, and it began flight operations on September 28th. They began making their mark with a few victories against both Allied fighters and bombers, with Captain Jörg Peter Ader already with kills in the jet while with EKDO-262 scoring the unit's first victories. Following the death of Novotny on October 8, 1944, after scoring these three last kills for a total of 258 victories, Ader was placed in command by Galland on the spot and the unit designation later became Yachtgeschwader 7. Some of the hottest fighter pilots from the Third Reich flocked to join. But the bomber arm also had their pilots making their mark, such as Major Wolfgang Bombo Schink, whose men had to modify their jets to drop bombs effectively when they received them, because they were not properly built for that purpose. Schenk and his men did ground attack missions, as well as strafing, and a few even managed to get aerial victories, but not being fighter pilots, they were not that successful. 
Every jet pilot learned to gently use their throttles or risk a flameout. The weak nose wheel was also vulnerable to damage on rough ground, and all the jet pilots knew that they were most vulnerable when taking off and landing. The jet had some advantages over piston engine counterparts. First, they did not use high-octane aviation fuel, which was very hard to come by late in the war, but instead burned kerosene. Another advantage was maintenance. The BF-109 model took about 9 to 10 hours to replace an engine. The FW-190A series was about the same, as well as the D model. Both engines on the 262 could be replaced in less than 4 hours, which was good because the average jet engine only lasted about 12 hours at most. The ME-262's weapon systems were formidable. Four 30mm cannon, and later some were armed with 24 R4M rockets, 12 under each wing. These were fired into bomber formations like a shotgun, and the pilots finished the job firing their cannons. The results were devastating. Jet fighter pilots were able to use their great speed advantage over the Allied fighters, mostly P-51 Mustang escorts and P-47 Thunderbolts, an attack from the rear or flank of the formations. This was a departure from earlier tactics of the head-on attack to minimize exposure to defensive gunfire. In one example, Oberleutnant Walter Schuck, flying with 3rd Group JG-7, scored four bomber kills in a row by using the flank attack method before being shot down by U.S. Mustang pilot Joseph Peterus. See our video on those two gentlemen. In another example, Oberleutnant Jörg Chipianka shot down a British Mosquito over Berlin at night flying with NJG or Nachtjagd 10. Some of the best pilots were Georg Peter Ader, who scored 12 confirmed kills in the jet out of his total of 78 victories, although he had another 12 unconfirmed. Colonel Heinrich Heinz Pritzelbeer scored 16 confirmed kills in the ME-262, flying with EJG-2 and Gallant's JV-44. Major Eric Rudolfer claimed 12 in the jet out of his 222, but his victory claims in total are questionable at best. The Allied fighter pilots who shot down the jets and learned their weaknesses and exploited them, such as ambushing their airfields, hoping to catch them taking off, or following them to their airfields after a battle when they were low on fuel and hitting them in the landing pattern. The Allied pilots were impressed with the jet's 540 mile per hour speed, 100 miles per hour faster than the Mustang and the P-47N at 467 miles per hour. At the end of the war, the EB-262 was at the top of the list for Operation Lusty, the program to collect all the German technology before the Soviets did. Of the 1,430 EB-262 jets built, most were destroyed in combat, with a handful brought to the UK and USA for testing. Today, only two original ME-262s are in flyable airframe condition after total rebuilds, and a few flying replicas delight spectators at airshows. I will close by saying that my personal interviews with about 20 ME-262 jet pilots and many Allied pilots who flew against them and shot them down provided great insight into the legendary jet. Their stories from the interviews and the complete story of the ME-262 can be found in my book, The ME-262 Stormbird, from the pilots who flew, fought, and survived it. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.